Well, welcome. We're so glad that um, you could join us this evening. We're excited for this webinar. Um, it's going to be all about emerging invasive species that we've identified in coastal ecosystems. Um, we are recording this, so we'll post it on our YouTube channel later for anyone who um, wanted to see it but couldn't join us live. Um, the way this will work, I'm going to give a quick introduction to IRC and our Restoring the Gold Coast program and how this invasive work kind of ties into that, why we care about it. And then I'm going to hand it over to George, who is going to walk us through these species that we have identified as emerging invasives. Um, we will also have a nice chunk of time at the end for a question and answer period. So you can either save your questions for the end or if you think of something as we're going through, feel free to put that question into the, um, the chat box and we will circle back to it um, when we get to that question time at the end. So let me go ahead and get started. So welcome, we're so glad everyone is here. Uh, my name is Kara Abbott. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs at IRC. And I'm going to, like I said, walk us through a little intro here. Um, looks like people entering the room more. All right, so our mission at IRC is we are dedicated to the protection, restoration, and long-term management of biodiversity on a regional basis and to the prevention of regional extinctions of rare plants, animals, and ecosystems. Um, our vision is uniting people and nature to restore our world. Um, if you're not familiar with IRC, here is some of just the amazing variety of work that we do. We have free online resources like the Floristic Inventory of South Florida, Natives for Your Neighborhood, Plants of the Island of Puerto Rico, a bilingual website. Um, we have some great Facebook pages that we help manage. We put out um, different planting guides for Pine Rocklands down in Miami-Dade gardening guide up here in Palm Beach County. Um, and this is just a very small sampling of some of the work we have put out. Um, we have two main programs currently at IRC. We have our Restoring the Gold Coast program up here in Palm Beach County. And then we have our Pine Rockland Initiative based out of Miami-Dade County. Uh, Restoring the Gold Coast was launched in 2019 thanks to um, an Impact 100 grant. Since then, we've gotten funding from the Community Foundation and um, New York Life. And we've been keeping this running ever since. It's a collaborative initiative to restore the incredible diversity of native plants and animals in coastal ecosystems in Southeast Florida, uh, primarily in Palm Beach County, because that's where our headquarters are based out of and where our funding to date has um, taken place. Um, RGC engages community members of all ages, as you can see in the pictures here, to be a part of the restoration process. So like I said, launched in 2019, here's just some of our major sponsors, other sponsors and some of our collaborators. Um, this top picture is from a recent planting event we had at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, um, expanding our reach into the Northern half of the county. And um, this bottom picture is of the federally endangered Jack Lamania Reclinata. We have um, a fun agreement going on there to restore habitat for this plant and um, to actually get it in the ground at some of our sites. Um, so some of the activities of restoring the Gold Coast include, you know, our big one facilitating recovery of biodiversity. Uh, we contribute to standards-based ecological restoration. We're really big on community engagement. So not just taking our crew of experts out to do the work, but really drawing on the community to collaboratively, um, you know, care about these issues and work on them together. And then we provide education and tools for students, local communities and visitors. I encourage you to check out Datas for Your Neighborhood and the Floristic Inventory of South Florida. If you are not familiar with those, uh, we have tons of extra information on there. And in the past, we've put out these biodiversity starter kits for our Restoring the Gold Coast program. Um, for our program, we primarily work on public coastal spaces, um, but a lot of times we would get private landowners who wanted to get involved. So we 
put together some um, great native plants to kind of create these little hot spots of biodiversity to build on the work we're doing in public spaces. And here is just some of the species we have helped restore. Um, you can see incredible diversity here from Opuntia, um, you know, cactus species to sea lavender, um, bay cedar, saw palmetto, all sorts of great stuff on here. And this is just some of what we have gotten in the ground. And although we are working with plants, we really are trying to take a holistic approach to our restoration and think about what our plants are directly affecting. So we're trying to foster habitats for things like birds and butterflies, and we take that into consideration as we come up with our plant lists, lists for our various sites. And these are just some of the butterflies that the plants we've added have helped. And so why do we care about this? Why restore our coastal ecosystems? Well, first and foremost, a biologically diverse beach dune ecosystem is a healthy dune, and it's our first line of defense against sea level rise, climate change, and catastrophic storms. We just recently had a great example of this with Hurricane Nicole. Um, here you can see roots out of all of these plants here in the dune, right? Keeping the sand in its place. Um, and biodiverse ecosystems have high integrity and are more resilient. So just a few reasons why this matters. And when we talk about restoring these ecosystems, I like to make sure we understand what it is we're trying to restore. So I'm just going to quickly walk through these historical ecosystems that we can find on our barrier islands. Uh, the first is the beach dune system. Um, this is the active for dune. It's in constant wind, salt spray, and it, it's periodically inundated with tides. Um, it's sometimes called the pioneer zone, and it's comprised of open herbaceous vegetation with no canopy. You're going to find things like sea oats, railroad vine, bitter panicum, and different salt spray tolerant grasses and herbs. Our next is the coastal strand. So um, this is found in between the beach dune to the east and maritime hammock to the west. Um, it is an evergreen shrub community and it is exposed to salt spray, which results in dwarfed shrubs and wildflowers being present in this ecosystem. And here you'll find things like saw palmetto, cocoa plum, beach verbena, and the federally endangered Jacquemania reclinata or beach cluster vine that I just showed a picture of. Um, and historically, you can see these great photos of what the coastal strand would have looked like and how much space these took up. There are also freshwater lakes, interdunal swales and swamps present, um, but we know almost nothing about them. There are remnant um, pockets of freshwater still present on the barrier island, but um, this is not one of the main ecosystems we find ourselves working in. Uh, the third main one is going to be our coastal hammock, or sometimes called the maritime hammock. This is found on the west side of the island along the intercoastal. Um, it's a predominantly evergreen hardwood forest. It inhabits the highest, most stable areas of the barrier island, and you're going to find things like gumbo limbo, Spanish stopper, wild coffee, and marlberry, and much more. So if these are our historical ecosystems, where did they go? Why is it that we're trying to restore them? Um, these two pictures are both from Delray Beach, but they offer a great perspective for what happened to the biodiversity. Um, in this left picture, you can see a small patch of A1A, and you can see how close that is to the water, and that there really is no dune system whatsoever here. In the other picture, you can see some non-native coconut palms, A1A, and then beach right there. So that was in 1956 for this picture. Um, we really just developed right up to the beach, and this was not sustainable, and eventually we realized that, um, you know, it's not sustainable, we need to get our dune back in place. So by the mid 20th century, the transformation was complete and uh, we started putting the dune back into place. Since then, there are a few things we've done well, like we figured out how to move sand. And you know, in these previous pictures, you can see just how small the um, area of sand is in these pictures. So we figured out how to widen the beach by moving sand. 
and we've reestablished the dune, um, but mostly just with a few species like sea oats, sea grapes, and a handful of others. And we've also worked really hard since then to recover sea turtles. Um, those efforts started in the 90s, and each year we're seeing the payoff finally in the last few years of um, those recovery efforts. But despite these things we've done well, uh, there are lots of areas where we are lacking critical biodiversity. Um, in this picture, you can see what is really just a large monoculture of sea grapes and not much else growing here. Uh, we still have invasive species that threaten native diversity. Uh, we have some common ones here like uh, beach alpaca or scavola toccata. This is the non native scavola. We also, of course, have our native scavola plumerii present on the beach. That is not this. Uh, Weedelia, this wild pea, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. All of these threaten native diversity because they uh, displace and choke out the native diversity. And so in restoring the Gold Coast, we spend lots of time dealing with invasive species, um, both because they don't belong there and we want them off of our sites, but also to create space to go in and increase biodiversity. So this is just a small sampling. I had so many pictures <laughs> to choose from for this slide of um, some of our awesome volunteers working on removing invasive species. And these pictures, it's primarily Scavola toccata, the beach naupaca, and then um, over here is Brazilian pepper. So these are our you know, category one, well-known, listed, established invasives. And, you know, in, at IRC and elsewhere, we've been talking about wouldn't it be great if we could prevent the next Brazilian pepper or beach naupaca, the non-native scavola, before they become as um, prolific as they are. So that leads us into why we're all here tonight. We want to talk about these emerging invasive species. Uh, what if we could identify the species that have potential to become the next Brazilian pepper or Australian pine and collectively target them before they take hold. So we have identified a list, a manageable size list of species that we um, are seeing naturalizing in our coastal ecosystems. And George is gonna walk us through those and um, we're gonna see if we can combat these before they become established. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to George. All right. Thanks a lot, Kara. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I just want to um, start by uh, reviewing a little bit about some of the work that's been done with invasive species in Florida. So most of you here are familiar with the uh, Florida Exotic Test Plant Council that um, operated for several decades that has now become the Florida Invasive Species Council. And so this organization produced the, the list of invasive species uh, for Florida for a, a long time. And this list is used to, uh, by regulators, for example, to prioritize um, funding for species control and removal. And, um, and so you can find the statewide list there. <clears throat> and so the, the Florida Invasive Species Council list um, puts together species that they rank as category one, which are the highest invasive species in category two, and Kara showed pictures of, of uh, some of those. But the, the criteria for getting on the FISC uh, list um, is the bar is set pretty high. So something has to be invasive and disruptive over a pretty large area for things to end up on that list. And, and in fact, um, some people, um, Jim Ducanel, for example, in the Florida Keys and, and Jennifer Posley in Miami-Dade County, for example, um, have had to work hard for long periods of time to get species that, that were very invasive, but had you know, more local um, effect uh, to get it on the list. So not everything that is invasive ends up on the list, and in some and in some cases things are are, are pretty bad before they before they get on that list. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, we have the Everglades Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, and, and this group 
their job is to look at what species are disrupting the the um, restoration of the Everglades. And so the e that we will call it, um, has a list much like the Flexi or Fisk list, the, the species that we all, we all know, but they also have developed over the last decade or more um, this list of early detection and rapid response species that um, a plan was put together um, more than a decade ago. And, and so every year or two, the e puts together a new list that includes these emerging invasives um, that they feel are a potential threat to the restoration of the Everglades. Next slide. All right, so if you go to the ESISMA page, you'll see this graphic, um, the invasion curve, and it really clearly shows the cost of doing nothing, that we tend to wait until it's too late um, before we start to act. And the consequence of that is that we lose habitat, uh, we lose species, and then we increase our costs over time. So the idea of the early detection rapid response or the idea of emerging invasives is one that um, is growing as people realize that we're waiting too late to, to take action. And then IRC on the right-hand side, IRC has been involved with a project with the South Florida Water Management District for the last uh, four years, where we have been um, implementing this corridors of invasion, early detection monitoring. And so the South Florida Water Management District also has their own list of species um, that are in a, a um, emerging invasives type list. And and that list is also a little bit different in the sense that it, it includes things that might be highly invasive already in parts of Florida, say parts of the Everglades, but are, are just emerging as problems in others. So for example, there might be species that are highly invasive and well-known invaders in Miami-Dade County, but they're just starting to get going in Palm Beach and Hendry County, for example. And so when we are working in those areas, we would be looking for those species. So we're, we're not only looking for things that are new all over South Florida, but things um, that are new in particular regions of South Florida. So we've had a bit of experience um, working with this, this idea. And so before we go to the next slide, um, uh, Kara and, and Kelly McLaughlin, um, who's also on the, on the call, working with Restoring the Gold Coast, pitched the idea of, of let's see if we can put together um, a, a list of emerging invasives and coastal ecosystems to go with Restoring the Gold Coast. And, and we've been looking for some funding to do that. So far, no, no one has, uh, has given us any money. So we're, uh, we're pitching it here as well until we, until we get the, uh, the support that we need to move it forward. Um, but the idea is, is that we're just getting started with this idea. Um, and we'd like your feedback and uh, get a conversation going. So um, let's go to the next slide, Kara. So what we're gonna do here, I think there are 16 or 17 plants and we're just gonna look at them in alphabetical order by scientific name. And I'm hoping that by the time we get to the end that you will see the, um, the variety of kinds of plants, of kinds of issues, of relationships to the listing process and, and so forth, so that we can then um, have kind of a well-rounded view of the problem. This list is not our final recommendation of what should be included, but we're starting to list these on our website and look forward to your feedback. So the first species that we're gonna look at is Elysicarpus vaginalis, white moneywort. And, and I put the IRC first discriminatory South Florida map on the left, and you can see that this is a highly, uh, a highly documented uh, weed and invader in Miami-Dade County. And it's just, um, it's just starting to, to move more aggressively um, north and, and west. And so um, this, is a, this is just a, in most people's mind, this is a weed. This is not something that we should worry about. But um, in Miami-Dade County, for example, 
we are finding this is actually becoming an invader in pine rocklands. And so, and we're starting to document it in Palm Beach County and coastal systems. So for example, I recently found this at Tips Ocean Park um, where it is uh, a threat to, um, to the coastal dunes and coastal strand that is, that is remaining there. So that's, that's one example to plant that's a weed from the old world tropics. Most people don't pay any attention to it whatsoever, but in fact, um, we think it could be uh, a big problem. Next. Okay, so Barlaria repens or coral creeper. Um, this really, uh, this got my attention for the first time in 2016 when I was in Oahu, Hawaii, and I found this growing on the beach dune there. And then it came up in a, uh, in a botanical garden that I was working in in Palm Beach County and found it to be incredibly difficult to get rid of. And, and so I kind of had this in the back of my mind. And, and then um, you see these records start to accumulate. So this is something that is uh, fairly widely cultivated now in South Florida and starts to be vouchered as naturalized and not until 2015. And then in pretty rapid succession, you can see that we're getting records in Broward and um, Dade and Palm Beach counties, um, not until 2022. So this is not one that we have records for um, in natural areas and coastal areas in, in Palm Beach County yet, but we will. It's only a matter of time. And so this is something that we want to kind of uh, wave the flag and, and say, hey, look, we know this is highly invasive elsewhere. Um, we know it's going to be really difficult to control. And so maybe we need to encourage people to or discourage people from using it, um, especially in coastal systems. But I suspect this would be a problem in, in, in scrub, for example, and, and other ecosystems as well. All right, next. Okay, so Carissa Macrocarp or Nate Hallplum, um, I remember eating this fruit uh, at our local church when I was in grade school. This is a plant that has been around South Florida since um, some of the earliest development in the area. And people don't think about it too much. People don't really uh, grow it, the, the original plant that much, although I've seen this kind of so-called dwarf form is now starting to get some traction in the landscape trade and so forth. But what we're finding is that some of the old plants that were left, um, for example, at Atlantic Dunes Park or at Chips Ocean Park um, are, uh, quite tenacious and spreading and it's it's taking a long time but this is something where now large areas are taken over by this plant and it's very difficult for other species to uh, to survive in the midst of, of these um, these uh, shrub these shrub lands um, and it's incredibly spiny difficult to move around and control and um, and so it's something that been around a long time it, it spreads slowly but it is invasive and it's incredibly difficult to get rid of once it gets going. Go ahead. All right, another plant that has been in the trade for a long time, this is Crinum asiaticum, there's, or poison bulb, I don't know who came up with that common name, um, but this has been grown in South Florida for a long time. It's no longer a favored species because there are other more attractive, colorful forms of crinum. But what has happened with this species is that it is um, spreading along waterways. So it has a big fruit that floats in on water. And so we're beginning to find it um, along canals and along the intracoastal. The photo kind of in the center top by Michelle Smith um, it's from Atlantic Dunes Park, Atlantic Dunes Park in Delray Beach, and so this is one that um, that we could probably dispense with pretty quickly if if we wanted to pay attention to it. But if we don't, then it can create these large stands and um, and uh, produces a lot of fruit. That every time we have a storm or we have a king tide. That, that is high enough to capture those fruits that are falling on the ground, it's going to be dispersed. All right. 
All right. So this um, this is a grass that Jimmy Lang turned me on to. This is Digitaria Arianta or Pangola grass. And so this one is a weedy invasive grass. It's never been cultivated to my knowledge in South Florida. Um, it is listed um, by eSysma and um, it's really aggressive. So I found this in the north part of the Delray Municipal Beach. It's taking over an area that's probably, I don't know, by this time, it's, um, for those of you who know Delray, it's probably half of one of those um, sections between the walkways, um, maybe a few hundred square feet um, or so, but it really intertwines with the sea oats. It's going to be incredibly difficult to get rid of without destroying everything. Um, and as you can see from that piece that I'm holding up, it has these super long stolons that go quite a long distance across the ground. So it is um, able to penetrate. Now, you know, people were not really paying attention to this and saying, oh, this is just a roadside weed or whatever, but under any definition of, in, of invasive, um, this, this grass has the capability of completely taking over and converting um, otherwise perfectly healthy and un disturbed beached in systems. Okay. All right, this next one um, for Creophetida or Mauritius hemp. This is uh, an agave relative. It's uh, native to South America, highly adapted to coastal ecosystems. It's been recorded quite a few times in the Florida Keys um, and it is widely cultivated um, if you go on some of the, you know, the plant sites, you'll find different uh, cultivars and varieties and people are planting it. Unlike agave, it has a soft tip, so it's not armed on the tip. So people, it's, a, it's an easier plant for landscapers to work with and you still get, kind of get that rosette um, appearance. Uh, and so you, you see this gap on the map. You see a lot of records in the Florida Keys, the Miami-Dade County. And then these records to the north of us, and I haven't, we don't have this on the map yet, but we found this in the interior in the water conservation areas in Broward County. And the fruits are, and the ball bills, actually the, 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 the pieces that fall, the um, sprouted fruits that, that uh, fall off are floating down the canals and it's starting to move. So this is one where we don't have records for Palm Beach County in the coastal zone, but um, people are planting it and we should um, absolutely expect this to show up. So this would be one that would be pretty easy if we could get it in front of people and get people to, to be aware of it. Then um, when it when it did pop up, we could uh, we could nip it in the bud. Next. All right, so Indigophorus fruticosa or shrub indigo, this is related to the um, to the indigo dye. Um, and this is a tropical American species. It's been in the floor as a weed for a long time. Um, it's naturalized more heavily in, um, in Miami County in the Florida Keys. And this is kind of a, um, this is a repeating theme. And part of the issue, that, part of the thing that's probably going on here is just things take time to move around and all of that, but there probably is an element of climate change and some of these things that have been well established in Miami-Dade and the Florida Keys are definitely starting to move and become more abundant to the north. So this is a species that uh, we recently documented at Loggerhead Marine Life Center growing in, in kind of the backside of the, of the pioneer zone in complete blasting wind. Um, some plants apparently have been there for quite a long time. And um, again, there's nothing really to stop this from spreading and taking over large swaths of coastal strand or even um, the more protected part of beach dune. And in the middle, the middle upper photo, that brown blob there on the right-hand side of the slide is just an accumulation of uh, probably 20 or 30 or more fruits in this one kind of mass. And each side, inside each of those fruits is four or five or more seeds. So it's quite productive and, um, and has the ability to move around quite well. Next. 
All right, so this is another case. This is Jacinia arborea, or bracelet wood. This is a very slow-growing cultivated shrub native to the West Indies and South America, native to uh, uh, Puerto Rico, for example. It's cultivated in South Florida, not a lot, but some. And it has been recorded in Palm Beach County. It's been grown in Palm Beach County, and I've seen it naturalized there. The most well-known records of it naturalizing are in the Florida Keys, such as at John Penny Camp Coral Reef State Park. And it is on the ESISMA early detection rapid response list. Um, but I just pulled up iNaturalist this afternoon, and here's a record from Chris Lockhart from Jupiter Island. So it is naturalizing there. So even these few plants, it's not widely cultivated, but it's a, it's a nice looking shrub. And, um, and so um, it is naturalizing and it's something that um, I know at Penny Camp, they've had a real hard time trying to get rid of it. And so um, we, uh, we should uh, pay attention. Go ahead. All right, Miletia pineda or carom tree. This has gone by many names, Pongamia, Daris indica, um, but uh, this is the current uh, nomenclature, at least last time we checked. And so this is a, this was a really common landscape tree in like the 70s, maybe into the 80s. It's no longer favored. It's grown by a few people, um, but it is widely naturalized in southeastern Florida. It's on the South Florida Water Management District list and um, was added to the East Sisma list in 2022. So this is something that's been around a long time. We know this is the way it works. Things that can be in the system for decades before they become a problem. And we've recorded it at uh, Ocean Ridge Hammock Park. So we know it's uh, salt tolerant and has the ability to invade uh, maritime or tropical hammocks from cultivated plants. Next. So we're going to see a, a few. This is one of what I call my big three for um, coastal Palm Beach County. And this is Mimisops coriacea or Asubo. And this is a highly invasive salt tolerant tree formerly cultivated in South Florida. It can grow above and outcompete sea grave. Um, it is on the South Florida Water Management District list and it's a native to South uh, to Madagascar. You can see the list of coastal parks where we have found it. Um, if you go down to Boca and go to Spanish River Park where they have cut um, some view lines um, uh, near, near that park, you can actually see fully grown trees that were left. So the sea grapes were trimmed and you can see these trees growing straight up into the full blast of salt wind with absolutely no damage. This is a serious threat um, to coastal ecosystems, both strand and hammock. And uh, so far, uh, we are not getting traction from eSisma or from uh, FISC to get this listed. Again, this is one where we, uh, our fear is we're going to wait too late um, to take action. Go ahead. This is a very interesting plant, Marinda citrifolia or Indian mulberry. This is a rare invasive shrub that's primarily moved around by ocean currents. So it gets established, it drops fruit, and then we have a storm, a king tide or something that moves around. And previously it was found in at, uh, at Cape Florida and in the Florida Keys. And then um, working with the city of Delray Beach and partners, we recently documented this at Delray Municipal Beach. So now we know that it is also moving north you can see the Atlas record. Oh, it's only vouchered for the Florida Keys, but in fact, we know it's in Dade, and now we know it's in Palm Beach County. So it's one that we need to keep our eye on because it's going to be moving. Okay. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. I think you're kind of getting the uh, getting the idea here. I want to make sure we have time for discussion. Um, so bear with me. Neronia or marginata or Madagascar olive. This is another one of my big three. This is an invasive shrub in current high demand in South Florida, native to Madagascar and starting to show up in coastal parks. And on the left is a screenshot from plantpan.com. This is in super high demand in places like the town of Palm Beach, where they're using it um, in part as replacement for ficus hedges. And so this is one where we're just cramming more and more and more plants into the environment. So we should expect this to become a major problem within the next decade. Go ahead. This is the third of my big three, Acrosia elliptica or elliptic yellowwood. This one's going to have white sap if you crack the leaves. 
Um, it's a highly invasive salt tolerant tree and it's still cultivated in a nursery in Delray Beach. I pulled up a record from Plantain today. It's uh, native to Australia and, and that region and it is on the South Florida Water Management di District list and was finally added to the East list in 2022. Go ahead. Cababuya heterophylla or white cedar. This is a very common landscape tree with beautiful flowers native to Puerto Rico and other parts of the West Indies. It's a common landscape tree, now widely naturalized, more to the south. Um, and so far, we don't really have records for it on, on the coast, but it, we know it's highly salt tolerant. It's been vouchered all over the Florida Keys. Um, and it's uh, on the ESISMA EDRR list. And uh, we got it added to the South Florida Water Management District list. So this is one that's gonna be cultivated on the barrier islands. And it's again, just a matter of time. So if we can get people to be on the lookout for seedlings of this, then we can hopefully um, keep it from spreading. Go ahead. Okay, so this is Vici Aracena or Montgomery palm. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with the solitaire palm. It's a, it's a fifth category two invasive palm. It's a tall, fast growing palm. Um, with small fruits, and this this Montgomery palm is a little bit more of an elegant, more elegant looking palm, a little slower growing, a little larger fruit, and it has um, really taken over the market uh, to replace solitaire palms, which are still cultivated and grown and moved around all over the place as well. But this is a really super po uh, popular palm, and it's on no one's radar. Um, I have on the on the left, it's it's grown all over the place, planted all over the place. And uh, this photo is from Red Reef Park in Boca Raton. And then the dot on the top, the red dot is at Atlantic Dunes Park where we have now documented that um, naturalizing into that forest. So this is one where the, the process of becoming invasive is just starting, okay? And Vigna adenantha or Leptospron adenanthum. Um, this is a weedy vine. As far as we're aware, no one has grown it. Um, we don't really know where it came from, but it's been naturalizing along the southeastern coast. It's not well established yet, but where it is established, it's highly aggressive, very difficult to get rid of. Um, and so this is one that we've documented at Delray Municipal Beach. We know it's in at least five of the sections of the beach. Um, and if we could get it out of there and keep it from spreading to other coastal situations in Palm Beach County, um, that would really be a great thing. And the last plant uh, on our list is Amia perforacea or cardboard palm. Very common, very popular landscape plant, highly salt tolerant, uh, native to Southern Mexico. It's not on anybody's list. And honestly, I have no idea why. Um, it is well documented as, uh, as naturalized. We know it invades intact beach dune, coastal strands, scrub, pine rockland. It is an invader. And yet to date, it's just gotten, it has not gotten the attention that it needs to. And here's a list of the different um, parks that we found it. Okay, so before we go to the next slide and back to Kara, I just want to, um, I just want to do a shout out for some of our partners, um, some of whom are represented on the call. One is the city of Delray Beach, who we've been partnering with. I saw Ken Edwards is on the call. And um, the city of Boca Raton has also been a great partner and has given us funding to do um, inventory. Both, of, both the city of Delray Beach and Boca have given us funding to, to do inventory work where we've been able to document some of these things. And, now, and then also I see Sam Wright is on the call. Um, a longtime uh, um, collaborator with uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, who's done a lot of the work on, on beach jacquemania. So I just wanted to uh, give, uh, there's a bunch of other people, sorry, <laughs> can't get to you all. But um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of great friends and colleagues on the call, but I wanted to, to uh, point out those partners. Okay, so Karen, next slide should be yours. We did this right. And uh, back to you. Through this list, I didn't want to just, you know, leave it on the end note of like, okay, here are the species. Um, here are really like what our suggested next steps would be coming off of this. 
Um, first is, you know, educate others. We will make this uh, presentation available online and we can, if it would be helpful, send out, you know, a like bullet point list that we covered the species here um, in this webinar. And then be on the lookout for these and report your findings. iNaturalist is what uh, we have been using in-house, um, you know, to track things, but whatever app you use, just report where you're finding these things um, because it will hopefully help them get the traction that, um, you know, we're hoping for them to get. And if you are a landowner or land manager, you know, hopefully you can keep an eye out for these and work to remove them before they become established and don't plant them, right? Hopefully that goes without saying at the end of this, but always good to, you know, just be clear on that. And then if you know of other non-native species that you think should be considered an emerging invasive, really just in South Florida in general, tonight was about coastal ecosystems, um, but if you know of any that you think should be included for South Florida, um, shoot me an email. We're curious to, you know, start tracking this and just so everyone is aware, for those of you that use um, the floristic inventory of South Florida, we have started um, putting in a one-liner at the bottom of the FISF page saying for these species that we consider them an emerging invasive in South Florida. And like George mentioned earlier, we are just beginning this process. Um, this is not a complete list, so we will grow this and we would love your input both on the species that we talked about tonight and if you think um, that there's anything else we should add to the list. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, I see that we have one in the chat already. You are welcome to um, come on and ask your question over the mic if you prefer or put it in the chat. So I'll go ahead and read off what we have in the chat right now. Um, so Patty Fairs, IRC board member, glad you're here, Patty. Uh, what about Clusia hedge being sold? Um, do you see it spreading or fear it little? Uh, all right, so Carol, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, can I make a suggestion that we close the slideshow so that we can, uh, folks, and uh, if people want to turn their cameras on, we could uh, have a have a conversation. If not, that's all right. All right, okay, so um, so Patty's asking about the Clusia hedge, which is taking over the landscape trade. Um, uh, it's also another replacement for ficus hedges, and um, it is, as far as we can tell, Clusia flava. Um, Carlos Trejo's on the call. He could uh, tell you a lot about this plant. Um, but thus far, we have found no fertile plants. So um, it's, in fact, um, it's very rare to see flowers on on this species versus uh, Clusia rosea, um, but this is the way it works. It's going to be here a long time, and eventually, you know, something will flower and there'll be fruits. And so the expectation would be over the long haul that that it could very easily become invasive, just like many of the ficus trees have. So, not a great thing. Great. Um, our next question, uh, should these species be recorded on apps at any location or just in coastal places and cultivated or wild or both? Not super familiar with the rules when it comes to, resport, to reporting species. George, what would you suggest? Yeah, so first of all, we, we would be interested in um, records of them naturalizing or being invasive um, anywhere, um, not so much cultivated plants because that's just gonna overwhelm us with data. So we really need plants that are clearly naturalized. So the general rule is that does not include seedlings underneath a cultivated plant. It would be things that are pretty far away from cultivated plants or in a natural area um, or invading or disrupting, something like that. And then just to clarify, Sarah put her email on there and we do recommend um, that people use iNaturalist or, or any uh, another app. There's you know Ed's Maps and other other tools, but then send us an email with a link to that record, because then we can then use that to integrate it into the Florida Inventory of South Florida. It's a lot less expensive, and we can do a lot more with the funding that we have by using these tools. But we still need the link. We need you to tell us that you've done this, um, or else we don't know about it. And so we don't, we can't really integrate it with our work. 
Great. Yeah. And then we have um, Fr Franklin who said that, you know, he agrees about the cardboard palm and he knows of two large plants that um, appeared and were not cultivated. So he will add them to INAP. That's awesome. That's what we like to hear. Susan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Susan. Great presentation, guys. Thank you. So I've been out to ERM sites and see some of these things. Um, how do we get to, not coastally, but how do we get to ERM and, and other agencies who are, you know, ERM land managers, et cetera? And yeah, that's one question. And the other question is, you know, so when, when I'm out on a hike and I see, what is it that I see? I see uh, uh, indigo ferrous, you know, the, um, do we pull it? Do we not pull it? Do we, um, do we, are there lookalikes that we need to be aware of? So there's a little bit more information that would be useful for, you know, for field guides, et cetera, because we like to be citizen scientists. Yeah, so, um, so part of the process would be to get the things that really need to be on the FISC list on the FISC list, right? So documenting things as invaders. So they, they need to be invading fairly intact natural systems. We need to collect as much of that data as we can. Um, and then get the information to ECISMA when they do their reviews. Um, that would be really helpful. So agencies like ERM in Palm Beach County are going to defer mostly to those official lists. Doesn't mean that they don't have their own list because they have their own people, their own experts on staff that see problems that don't that don't get elevated to the level of ECISMA. Well, that's how ECISMA and FISC occurs because these land managers you know, they see these problems um, and, and they bring it to the attention of, of the listing process. So um, we have not cross-checked this list with anybody in ERM. So that's another thing that could occur if people are interested and think this, this other layer of, of conversation and, and research is, is, is worth doing, right? Some people might say, ah, just leave it all with ESISMA, right? Well, that's probably, you know, that could work, but in our experience, it's not gonna work. Um, but to answer your question, ultimately, we would want to be able to get our information to Delray, to Boca, to the town of Palm Beach, and so forth, um, and find out what, you know, are other people aware of some of these species? Are they concerned about some of these species um, so that we can, we can get them elevated? Um, then with regard to your issue of do you pull them and are there lookalikes? Well, yeah, um, there are lookalikes, and no, you probably shouldn't pull them unless you are working with the land manager, and 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 so forth for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, and in the case of the indigo opera, for example, um, we're concerned about it. That's an interesting one because we are interested in, it and we're concerned about it in the coastal system, but um, maybe not so much um, in some of the interior systems. So some of these things are going to be more problematic in certain ecosystems and not others. And so we need to tease that apart. But, but like, I know a lot of people on this call know Richardia grandiflora, right? So it's, a, it's an herbaceous thing. Nobody paid attention to it for the longest time. It's got a big flower. And now it's, you know, they're having trouble with it all over the place. And scrub, it's just been horrific. Um, and in coastal strand, uh, competing with Giacomani reclinata, for example, I know Sam is aware of that as well. But plants like Elysicarpus, for example, um, or this in the opera are, are equally, um, it's equally possible that those are going to become just as bad. And anybody that's tried to deal with Richardi Grandiflora knows what I'm talking about. It's serious. It's not like a little cute lawn weed anymore. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's frightening. And so um, anyway, that's the kind of thing we're trying to, to, to get, get people to think about. One last thing, I, mean, I know that you have a, um, a talk scheduled at the Native Plant Society and I hope that you can do this talk. Just- I do? I think or you do, I don't know when it is, but I think you do. <laughs> yeah, awesome. well, if you, like, if you like this talk, then, then yeah, let us know. And, and cause we can do it other places for sure. Yeah, now that it's done. Yeah, and we have a question from Sam. You're on mute, Sam. You're still on mute. Oh, here I can. One sec. Yeah, unmute him. There we go. Sorry. You should be good now. Hello, everyone. Hello, George. Good. good to see everyone. 
Um, I wanted to mention when I first uh, found out about this uh, presentation, I was kind of racking my brain. I haven't been in South Florida now for 10 years, occasionally go back, but I haven't really worked there in over 10 years. And I was kind of racking over my brain, like what possibly could be some of the species on your list. And uh, Indigofra was one that really came to mind um, when I was you know, doing research, surveying coastal areas, that was definitely a species that I, I would see. I wouldn't say at the time that it it seemed invasive, but it definitely was present. It definitely, uh, you know, occurred in, in pretty large numbers. Um, so that's that's definitely a, a concern I would have for sure. All right, Sam. Good to see you. Yep, oh, also. <laughs> Oh, and he uh, put into the chat too, do you know if Cardboard Palm has been submitted to uh, FISC? I do not know. I would suspect that it has. Um, I, uh, like, I, I, like I said, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, there's just too many species in, in sure. for, for the hours in the day. Right. Um, but, but now that we're circulating this list, then we can learn a little bit more about the process and find out um, which ones have been submitted and rejected, which ones have not been submitted that just need to be submitted and so forth. But I will, I will tell you that, um, that as much as we would like for this process to be fully scientific, there is also more hesitation, I would say, to list things that are in the landscape trade. That, the, that, that even though it's not official, and even though it shouldn't work this way, that what I find is actually practically true is that the bar is set higher for things where the fear is they're going to get pushed back from um, from the the powers that be um, in, in in the landscape system. Awesome. And we have just a couple minutes left. Um, are there any other questions? Looks like Diane might. Hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Um, so I know iNaturalist has projects um, and I just wanted to know if you guys, if IRC has a project on there or if you're planning to have a project on there, we can start uh, adding adding to it. Good idea. Michelle Smith, I see you're on the call. Can you do that for us? Well, we can call. Sorry, um, what was the question? Can we, yeah, the suggestion is that we set up a project with this so people can add um, to, to it with for these species. So the answer to Diane is yes, we can do that. Figure it out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get with Michelle after this and we'll make sure that happens. We've set up other projects like when we've done bio blitzes on the coast and stuff. And so that's a great idea. Um, we will. Oh, okay. I've seen those. I didn't know that was that was IRC. I didn't realize. Oh, fun. <laughs> okay, maybe we could get. Um, sorry, uh, Sarah, if I'm stealing your your microphone, but maybe we could get um, a show of hands of people that think this is a good idea to pursue. Should we keep going? Do we think this is good? All right. This <laughs> like <laughs> this is a no brainer. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Cool, cool. All right, Terry, you want to close this up? Yeah, Back so call. in closing, we are, you know, this has been recorded. We're going to get it on our YouTube channel and we'll, um, you know, spread the word on this more. I will type up like a nice neat list of these species um, to have available. Um, like I mentioned, we are putting a little disclaimer on FISF um, whenever we internally deem these an emerging invasive. So we'll continue doing that. Um, and yeah, Sam has one more quick question. We have two minutes, that's fine. Yeah, so uh, the question I had, and I know when you showed the, the earlier photo of uh, Boca Raton and, and showing what the habitat type was compared to what it is now, and you know, fire was a, a large component to what shaped this dune ecosystem. So I was wondering if, 
it was possible. And I know, you know, some of these areas are very uh, developed, you know, in areas around the park. So it would be possible for fire to be reintroduced to some of these parks to somehow deal with some of these invasives. I, I think it will be a long time before um, anyone in South County would uh, think about that. I think the leadership for that idea really needs to come from North Palm Beach County. From mm -hmm. you know, there are you know kids like Juno Dunes, for example. Sure. Um, but the issue, but the issue there, as you know, is the conflict between uh, turtles and lights, coastal strand, and so this is the problem. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get back, trying to figure that out. Um, but um, but I, I think that if you look at wind and you look at population density and you look at the size of the of the coastal system, that if we could get something like that to occur um, in somewhere in North County, um, in the Juno Dunes, Jupiter area, that 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 may be some, you know, the the proof. You know the the proof of concept idea would be really important. I think it would be really tough to to sell it in these really tiny um, remnant patches. Until right. that happens, we have to do surrogates to fire like hardwood reduction and things like that. And yeah. and um, as Ed Edwards and I'll could tell you, it's 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 the stakeholder engagement that's going to be required to get people to understand why you need to cut down sea grates. Uh, much you know, uh, well, it's hard to get to cut down Australian pines. In some cases, Brazilians have much less secret. So we have a long, long way to go, Sam, to 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 get to that. And we are at the hour, Sarah. Yeah, awesome. If you um, think of anything after the webinar, I did put my um, email in the chat, and you can find me on the staff page um, on IRC's website. We would love, you know, feedback. If you think of anything else, and um, we just appreciate your time and that you all joined us for this this evening. So have a great rest of your evening and thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you guys again. Great.